to you this morning. Um, everybody here knows who I am. I'm Sheila, one of the pastors here. For the, those of you online, we welcome you. And you know what? It's especially nice this morning to see faces. <laughs> Most of the faces. Now, some of you are much more comfortable with your mask, and I'll just let you know I have one in my bag, and if I'm talking to you, I'll put it on. But it's really great to have you here this morning. As we come to worship this morning, you know, we think about the fact that God's uh, loving disposition towards us was settled at the cross, but we're human. And sometimes some of the circumstances in our life can shake us and shake our confidence in who God is for us. But we can gain confidence, and I want to share that a verse in Psalm 31, 1 to 3. It says, In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. Let's just bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity we have this morning of being together. We thank you for the chance to come to worship you. Lord, we thank you that Trish is able to be with us this morning. We pray that you would just also minister through her in music. We ask it in your name. Amen.
hopefully this song's a little bit more familiar.
um, it just reminds us of what he did for us on Calvary. And we're going to celebrate together that remembrance, that remembrance of him dying on the cross for us. So if you don't have your uh, communion cup, just put your hand up or something. I'm sure somebody can get one for you. And we're going to read a passage of scripture. It's not the one we usually read when we're doing um, communion, but I'm going to read the one out of Luke 22. And when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So before he died, he told them he was not going, this was the, this is what he was doing. We commemorate that today. So as we celebrate, let's just bow in prayer and thank God for that death, that resurrection. We thank you, Lord, for coming to this earth. We thank you for the death, the resurrection. We thank you that this supper that Jesus initiated before his death is a reminder of all that he's done for us. We pray that you would just bless during this time together. So the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread. I'm going to give you thank, he broke it. And he said, this body is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I'd ask that you just lift the seal, the clear seal on the top of your wafer. Lord, we thank you for the gift of Jesus who came, who came to this world to live and die and to offer his body as a sacrifice for our sin. Amen. Let us eat this bread in remembrance of Christ's sacrifice for us. Let us eat together. And then when we come to the cup, we just lift the colored foil and there, the cup is there and we're reminded in the same way he took the cup also after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes father we give thanks for the blood of Christ that was shed on the cross for our sin. We just ask that you would help us to remember the sacrifice and that you would help us to accept the forgiveness that is ours because of the blood shed. Jesus said, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. I'm going to ask you that to stand and worship with us in a song that reminds us of God's great love for us.
Thank you, Trish. Birthdays this week. Uh, today, Dolores Toner has a birthday. I believe she's turning 50, but she didn't want me to tell anyone. <laughs> and on Monday, David Bell has a birthday. And on Saturday, Pam DeMerchant, Rhonda Savoy, and Jean Finnamore have a birthday. Anniversaries this week. Uh, Debbie and I have an anniversary tomorrow. And on Saturday, Trent and Sandy Crabb have an anniversary. Announcements for this coming week. Sheila's group for women is, will be held on Monday at uh, 12 o'clock noon here at the church. Uh, prayer walk continues this week on Tuesday, uh, meeting at the arena parking lot at uh, 10 a.m. Grief share is on Thursday at uh, 6.30. Uh, young adults, uh, next gathering is Sunday, August the 15th at 8 o'clock uh, at the Parsonage, and Manuscript Bible Study is again on Monday, August the 16th, from 7 till 9 uh, online. Uh, Pastor Nathan and Sabrina continue their vacation until August the 9th. Uh, mortgage update, as of July the 1st, the remaining amount on our mortgage is 59278 so we Thank you for all the uh, donations and uh, prayers towards the, uh, the reduction of the mortgage. The uh, church uh, worship team is seeking a guitar player. Uh, I kind of asked Trish if she wanted to come back, but uh, she said it was uh, too far to commute. But uh, if anyone is able to uh, or wants to join the worship team as a guitarist or other instrumentalist, uh, you can see Mary Ann or uh, Sabrina for, uh, for that. Um, at the end of August, August 28th, there's an end of summer carnival. Hard to think of end of summer already, but uh, we're uh, planning for that. To volunteer, contact Pastor Nathan or uh, Catman uh, if you want to uh, volunteer to help out with the end of summer carnival. Just a reminder, pre-service prayer is held every Sunday here at the church at 10 a.m in the family room. And Horizon Health continues to use our church building uh, for the COVID vaccines by appointment or by uh, drop-in. And the next uh, one is on this Thursday at uh, August the 5th. And at this time, the children can be dismissed to, to the river program. Even more so when we can't have the usual family and friend visits. When, um, you know, I think of my Aunt Mary who lives in Port Fairfield and not being able to go see her unless we visit at the border is frustrating. And sometimes these feelings and circumstances in our life can shake us emotionally and spiritually. It might even shake our confidence in who God is and who he is for, that God is for us right now. So I want you to look in Psalm 71. We're going to read that passage together. We have a technical difficulty. We'll wait a second. Okay. So reading together in Psalm 71. In you, O Lord... Do I take refuge? Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge to which I may continually come. You have given the command to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O oh my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and the cruel man. For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust. O Lord, from my youth, 
Upon you I have learnt, leaned from before my birth. You are he who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is continually to you. I've been as, as a port, I have been as important to many, but you are my strong refuge. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. Do not cast me off in the, name of the, in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength is spent. For my enemies speak concerning me. Those who watch for my life consult together and say, God has forsaken him. Pursue and seize him, for there's none to deliver him. O God, be not far from me, O my God. Make haste to help me, for my accusers be put to, let, may my accusers be put to shame and consumed with scorn and disgrace may they be covered who seek my hurt. But I will hope continually and will praise you yet more and more. My mouth will tell of your righteous acts, of your deeds of salvation all the day, for their number is past my knowledge. With the mighty deeds of the Lord God, I will come. I will remind them of your righteousness, yours alone. O oh God, from my youth you have taught me, and I still proclaim that wondrous deeds. So even in old age and with gray hairs, O oh God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to another generation, your power to all those to come. Your righteousness, O oh God, reaches the high heavens. You have, who have done great things, O oh God, who is like you? You who have made me see many troubles and calamities will revive me again. From the depths of the earth, you will bring me up again. You will increase my greatness and comfort me again. I will also praise you with the harp for your faithfulness, O oh my God. I will praise, sing praise to you with the lyre, O holy one of Israel. My lips will shout for joy when I sing your praises to you. My soul also, which you have redeemed, and my tongue will talk of your righteous help all the day long. For they have seen, been put to shame and disappointed who sought to do me hurt. And God always blesses the reading of his word. So when we look at this psalm, it says, Oh, to you, in you, O Lord, do I take refuge. And then he goes on, in your righteousness, deliver and rescue me. He goes on to say, be my rock. And in those first three verses, it's kind of like a prayer. The psalmist is uttering petitions for deliverance, for rescue, and for God to listen. And he also recounts in that psalm his rich history of his relationship with the God. So in Psalm, is a, it's really a prayer, Psalm 71, is a prayer of an older man with many trials and problems, but he's obviously a joyful man who is able to put his focus on the Lord in the midst of all his trials. And this psalm kind of shows us, to put it simply, that God's way to plan for the future is to develop a walk with him now and continue that walk throughout our lives. It shows how one person leaned on God and he was strongly supported throughout his whole life. And I bet there's a lot of people here who you leaned on God early on in life and you've seen him there with you through everything in your life. We're invited to do the same thing. I believe that we, the church, are also invited to do the same thing. If a church is to survive, we need to lean on God to support us. We need to lean on God to give us direction, and we need to lean on God's direction even when we don't like the direction he's taking us. Now, some of us like to take our own way, but God has a plan for us. The reason that the psalmist could handle the problems he was facing and handle them so well was because he developed a walk with God in the years leading up to that time. He had a proven resource in the Lord, and that resource enabled him to be strong inside, even though his body was growing weaker and his enemies were powerful. Many of you have developed that walk with God throughout your youth. Some of you are just starting to develop that walk now, and hopefully all of us are continuing to grow in our walk. 
because you don't just stop walking. When you stop walking, you don't move. So how do you do that? How do you develop that? I believe that there's three aspects of his walk with God which the psalmist has developed over the years and which remain with him at this time of trial in his life. And we as Christians and we as the church need to develop these same three areas of our life. The first one we need is we need to continually develop a deep knowledge of God. This psalm is filled with deep personal understanding and practical knowledge of God. The psalmist has been taught about God even from his youth in, 17, in verse 17. Oh God, from my youth you've taught me. The man knew God as his refuge. In, psalm, uh, in verse 1, he said, you are a strong refuge. And he knew him as his righteous savior in verse 12, 2. God's righteousness is frequently mentioned here. And he refers to his faithfulness, God's faithfulness to his own people. In his fortress, his hope, his confidence. He talks about God's mighty deeds. He talks about God's strength, his power, and the great things he's done. And he realized that it was God who brought him through the, tr um, the troubles, and he was going to deliver him, and he was going to restore him. God was his source of comfort in trial. Was God our source of com in comfort and, and comfort for us during the trials that we have in our life? God had redeemed his soul, and as he exclaimed, he said, Oh God, who is like you? And this psalmist could testify that his mouth was filled with God's praise and glory and righteousness all day long. Even when he was having a rough day, he could praise God. Even when he was doing something he didn't want to do, but he had to do it, he could praise God. This man knew his God. He didn't just know about God. He knew God. It was obvious that he'd known him for years and had proved God's faithfulness in numbers of previous difficult situations. So in this incident, when he needs to trust in God, it's a matter of God. It's not like, God, if you exist, would you help me here? If you're out there, could, I could use your help. He didn't need to take a blind leap of faith because he knew his God in a personal, a practical and a proven way. And many of you know God like that. You developed this knowledge through his word and applied it to your experiences in life. We all have different experiences, but God's word can be applied to each of our lives. You learned of God from your parents, from faithful pastors, Sunday school teachers, VBS, camp, and then in turn, you who are parents taught it to your children and those of you who are grandparents taught it to your grandchildren. You learned it from Sunday school songs. You learned it from worship songs. You learned it from studying God's word. You learned it by sitting under sound preaching. And because of that knowledge, you are better ready for whatever crisis you have to face in your life. And you'll have to and any that you're going to have to face in the future. I don't want to even think about what it would be like facing, well, just exam the last two years without God. You and I both need to continue spending time now in God's word, getting to know God better. And if you're really close with someone, you know, when you're really close to someone and then you stop spending time with them and you stop talking to them and you stop thinking about them, after a while, you feel pretty distant from that friend, don't you? You still love them, they still love you, but that close relationship is strained. When you reach out and renew that bond, you once again enjoy that closeness. Sometimes we draw away from God. He's still there waiting for us, but we distance ourselves from him. To maintain that closeness with God, we need to spend time with God continually and to accept his love his compassion, and his guidance. As you read his word, ask yourself, hmm, what does this passage teach me about my God? And then seek to apply it to your daily problems. Clearly, 
Some things have changed over the thousands of years since this psalm was written. We in, as Christians are still invited and we're still challenged, though, to lean on the Lord, even though the wicked, the unjust, the cruel are, are still a threat. We as a church are invited to lean on the Lord through difficult times in a hostile, hostile world. What about those around us who might come to this church or who live in the community with us? How do we as Christians and as the church help them to develop that knowledge of God? You know, we can't go out in the street and grab them by the neck and preach to them. But how do we help them develop it? Well, first, I think we have to show the love of God. As they see God's love in our lives and extended towards each other here, towards ourselves, and then to the community around us, they're more likely to want to listen when we tell them about God, what God has done for us and what he will do for them. They're more apt to listen about God's love if they see his love in action with us. You know, the phrase, they will know, the song too, they are know we are Christians by our love. Do they know it? Do they see it? Many of the people that I've reached for Christ were convicted as I shared John 3.16. What a simple verse. I shared it with them and assured them that they don't need to make themselves good before they accept Christ. God loves them just the way they are. No matter what age they are, no matter what, God loves them and he's willing to accept them into, and, and, and comfort them and help them grow. The only thing we have to remember as Christians, they need the milk of the word in order to grow, the same as children do. And as a church, we have to be careful to provide that milk for those who are early in their Christian walk, but be sure to provide the meat for those who are further along in their Christian walk. So this psalmist developed a deep knowledge of God as a youth with the milk, older on with the meat. We must develop, develop a similar knowledge of God. He all, and he also developed godly habits. And he developed in this psalm, we can read about his habit of trust, his habit of praise, and his habit of hope. So we need to develop the godly habits of trust, praise, and hope. Now, a habit is developed by frequent repetition over a period of time. And as you know, bad habits are really easy to learn. You just keep doing it and doing it, and you got the habit. Once it's in place, a habit becomes almost involuntary. Our attitudes, how we respond mentally and emotionally to life's problems, tend to become habitual responses. Some people become habitual worriers. Some become habitual complainers. Some become habitually negative, pessimistic, and angry. Others become habitually cheerful and positive. Which type of people do you want to be around? Remember the habits we develop in our younger years tend to take us further in that direction as we grow older. We develop ha good habits, it goes with us. We develop poor habits, they go with us. And we can also develop good habits later in life. Gordon T. Smith, in a book I read called um, Called to be Saints, reminds us that a vital function of the church needs to be regular teaching and preaching that spiritual maturity is our calling. We're called to be saints, we're called to salvation, but we are also called to maturity, and we need to mature. And the word repeated in verse 3 and verse 6 and, for, and verse 14 is continually. And it tips us off to the habits leading to spiritual maturity that the psalmist had developed. They're not habits he picked up naturally. They must be deliberately cultivated. In fact, they stem from his knowledge of God. They're the habits of trust, praise, and hope. Now, this past winter, I took a course called Spiritual Formation from Acadia Divinity College, and I learned more about how to develop those spiritual habits in my life. I also discovered that there were a lot of spiritual habits, and you can't develop them all. So you have to look at your life and what you need 
and work on those habits because you could just run yourself to death trying to develop all these habits and it would become a chore instead of a, a blessing and, and chance to get closer to God. So the habits we need to develop, I'm thinking of the three most important ones, the habit of trust. And that's in Psalm 71, verse 3. The whole psalm is really an affirmation of the psalmist's trust in the Lord. He was struggling because he was in difficult circumstances with many seeking his life. But he didn't falter in his faith because he knew whom he believed. And you know, such faith, I think, stems from your knowledge of God. True knowledge dispels doubt and fear. We fear and we must tr mistrust those things that we don't know. Whereas, we're more inclined to trust that which we know well, assuming it's trustworthy. What do you trust? Do you trust your parents, your spouse, your friends? Probably, you trust those you know best and have experienced their trustworthiness. You know, when someone else comes into your, your circle, it takes you a while to trust them. You gotta, you gotta see whether they're trustworthy. Because the psalmist knew God, he had learned to trust God through some tough times, and he knew, therefore, that God would see him through this time. So are we developing a habit of trusting God in the difficult times of our life? Or are we frequently filled with worry and doubt and fear? If you have trouble trusting, concentrate on getting to know God. Review what God has already done for you. Remember that song, count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. And when you look back and you count the blessings, it's easier to trust in the days that are ahead. There's a tremendous emphasis in the psalm on what God has done. Reviewing what God has done and celebrating answered prayers strengthens our faith. Has God ever preserved your life? Has he saved you from your sins? Has he answered your prayers? Has he sustained you this far? Has he been there in the past when you felt that no one else was there? Then you can trust him for your present problems and any problems in the future. If we're going through difficult times, we need to trust God to get us through it. Sickness, we need to trust God to get us through it. Remember, I always think of that woman with the issue of blood. Remember, she was in that crowd, and she just reached out, and she didn't speak to him. She just touched his garment. She had the faith, and what happened? He was healed. We need to reach out to God in that same way. So we have to have that habit of trust, but we also need a habit of praise. He says in Psalm in verse 6, my praise is continually of you. Now, praise is not a natural habit at least not for mo many people. They're grumblers, they're complainers by nature. But God wants us to be a people of praise, even when difficult times come into our lives. God wants us to learn to praise him. The psalmist had deliberately developed that habit. He says, my mouth is filled with your praise, but I will hope continually and will praise you more and more. Another quote from his. And then in, he says, I will also praise you with the harp for your faithfulness, O God. I will sing praises to you with a lyre, O Holy One of Israel. My lips will shout for joy when I sing praises to you. We need to do a whole lot more singing praises to God. So how do we learn to praise God when trials come? Well, first, we have to learn to trust him. Because just as trust stems from knowing God, praise stems from trusting God. And this is true in the human plane as well as the divine. You can't praise a person you don't trust. If you feel there's something about a person that you can't trust, you won't sing their praises to someone else. I'll just give you an example. A mechanic. I trust Reg Grant as a mechanic. Um, used to be Frank Maber was my mechanic for many years, and then he retired, and now I have Reg. And deep down I know that he's going to do right by me, whether I'm buying tires, or having a repair done. He'll do the work right, and he won't overcharge me. So I sing his praises to others. And if somebody says, well, gee, where could I find a mechanic? I'm apt to mention him, because I trust him, and that's the experience. It's the same way with God. If deep down inside, 
You doubt God's goodness or faithfulness for allowing some trial to come into your life, then you don't trust him. And not trusting him, you can't honestly praise him, and you can't recommend him to someone else. And then another thing of learning that is review what God has already done. As I mentioned, count your blessings. And we tend to forget the many benefits that we have from him. As we focus on the blessings already received, we're drawn to praise him. As we focus on answered prayer, we're inclined to pray more, aren't we? Because we know that God's going to answer that prayer. So let's work on developing an important habit of trust. We need to trust him, we need to praise him, and then the final one I want to mention today is the habit of hope. The psalmist had not only developed habits of trust and praise, but he'd also developed a habit of hope. And we need to understand there's a big difference between secular hope and biblical hope. Both forms of hope contain the idea of future expectations. But secular hope is uncertain because its object is uncertain. Like, you're hoping on someone, but you can't be sure. Whereas biblical hope is sure because God is the object of our hope. For you, O Lord, are my hope. Believers should be people who have a habit of hope built on the promise of God. Unfortunately, many Christians have picked up on the negative, hopeless spirit of the world because they're focused on problems instead of on God and his promise. If you're developing that habit, it'll make you bitter. It won't make you any better. It'll make you bitter. God's people should be people who hope in God, people who stand on his promises. I always think of Bill Thompson. He used to say that we had to be standing on his promises instead of sitting on the premises. Even in the face of difficult circumstances, when our faith may waver and hang on by a thread, if you read Psalm 71, it should encourage you to hope in the Lord. Hope in confident is a confident desire, a feeling that something desirable is likely to happen. For Christians, God is the source of our hope, the source of our confidence that something good will happen or can emerge from the disappointment and heartache. In 2012, for example, this congregation lived through a devastating flood. One too many floods for the old, had an impact on the old building. Did we give up and say, that's it? No. God blessed us with leaders who shared his vision. And my, nine months to the day of the flood, we had our first service in this building. We had an almost $400,000 mortgage, which is now down below 60000 Our hope in God's continual blessing is being fulfilled before our eyes. That same hope is why the psalmist was in good stead in his old age, because he developed a deep knowledge of God, and he developed godly ha habits of true trust, praise, and hope. So he had that deep knowledge of God, he developed the godly habits, and then we need to develop a lifestyle of ministry for God. Although the psalmist was older and could have kicked back and said, I deserve some rest, he still had a concern for ministry, for testifying to others of God's faithfulness and power. In, in verses 8, 15 to 18 and 24, as long as he had breath, he wanted to tell people about God's greatness and glory. Now, a worldly attitude has infiltrated the church, and it goes like this. I work all week, so my weekends are my free time to spend as I please. If we give God a couple of hours by going to church on Sunday, we feel like we've paid our dues. We don't want to be tied down with any kind of Christian service that would hinder us from taking off for the weekend when we feel like it. Now, I'm going to make a radical statement that might step on some toes, but check it out in the Bible to see if I'm right. If you're not involved in some kind of Christian service, maybe you're too self-centered. I know that there are times in life when we're busier with family and job than any other time. Maybe we're busy with aging parents. But if, if all you're doing is coming to church once in a while to take something you can get from it, if your focus is, what can I get out of church, rather than how can I serve the Lord through this church, you're kind of out of balance. There should be no such thing as a non-serving member of the body. You say, well, how can I serve? 
The people in this church who are praying are serving God. Prayer is vital to the ministry of this church. You can be serving in prayer. Even when you're at work, even when you're driving someplace, you can be serving in that prayer. You can be serving by encouraging. People in ministry need encouragement. People who are struggling in life need encouragement. That phone call that you make encourages someone. That is service to God. Some of you cook for hungry people or shut-ins. That is service to God. Some of you teach. That is service to God. Some of you visit. And the list goes on. There's so many things. How were you serving? And I bet some of you sitting here today didn't realize you were serving God in those things, but that's what you're doing. Now, with regard to age, I think we need to challenge the North American t idea of retirement. We tend to go into the cultural view that retirement is a time of life when we do what we want to do, but as Christians, we never earn the right to do what we want to do with our time. We never have the right to live selfishly. All of life must be lived under the lordship of Christ. And where in the Bible do we find the magic number 65 or freedom 55 like I took and we're just retired from our Christian work, our Christian ministry? If you're freed up from your job and you're healthy, why not view it as an opportunity to serve the God more, serve him full time? You know, if at 55 you decided to retire from your job and do more things for God, um, if you live to be 80, you get two and a half decades of service that you got a chance to do. And you could do more. The point is, the psalmist didn't want to be delivered from his problems so that he could play golf or go fishing or, um, you know, make quilts. He wanted to be delivered so that he could proclaim God's power to the next generation. He had a vision of it to hand off the baton to the younger generation. You see in the Olympics the, the races, and you see that sometimes um, they get messed up and somebody, the person that's getting the next baton gets in the wrong place. But we still have to try to pass that baton to the next generation. He saw a longer life as an opportunity for extended ministry. And his ministry was built on his knowledge of God and his habits of trust, praise, and hope. So... He had something worthwhile to hand off. How about you? Are you developing a lifestyle of ministry now, built on your personal walk with God? It makes up for a meaningful life as you grow older. Many of you developed a lifestyle of ministry built on your personal walk with God. It's meaningful to you every day, today, and then all the years later, it's going to have that same a meaning to you. Some minister behind the scenes, some invisible ministries, but you continue to minister to God. You are investing and you're building your legacy. Are we passing that same lesson on to the next generation? Are we helping them build that legacy of love for God and love for others that we had developed in us? I hope we are. God's way for us to grow old is for us to develop a walk with him now, a walk that involves a deep, personal, experiential knowledge of God, a walk that includes the habits of trust, praise, and hope, and a walk that involves a lifestyle of ministry for God. Then as long as we have life and breath, we can show and tell and sing of the greatness of our God to the next generation. What a way to live. The psalmist had served God all his life, and now, in old age, he was experiencing many problems. Didn't he deserve better treatment? Why wasn't he bitter? Because he knew God personally, he trusted God personally, and he had served God personally. For those of you who have done the same as the psalmist, thank you for the service you've given to God and continue to give. With the psalmist, join in this refrain from Psalm 71 verses 22 to 25. I will praise you with the harp for your faithfulness, O my God. I will sing praises to you with a lyre, O Holy One of Israel. My lips will shout for joy when I sing praises to you, my soul also, which ha you have redeemed, and my tongue will talk of your righteousness help all the days of my life. For they, have, they have been put to shame who disappointed, who brought me so much hurt. Praise God. 
And that's the, the message that we have is that our life with Christ is forever building that knowledge. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for that example in Psalm 71 of how we can build our life around you. Thank you for the promise that as we love you, as we, as we trust you, as we build the habits, as we serve you, that you'll continue to bless us and you'll help us to bless others around us. Just be with us now as we continue in time of prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. morning. Before we go to prayer, um, the first Sunday of the month is always our food bank Sunday, so today's food bank Sunday. And I worked the food bank last week, so I thought I'd, I'd share a few things that I learned, because I didn't know about it, so I figured you probably don't either. Uh, the food bank has, for the last two summers, uh, been providing lunches to children um, that are in need, and they've been identified through the school system. So these are kids that aren't necessarily clients, their families aren't clients of the food bank, but they also need help. There's 87 children that have been provided for this summer. Um, out of that, 23 has been provided for funding for the food bank. So I had someone ask me, why do we keep having to give juice boxes and snack bars and, and the uh, fruit cups? Well, that's why. They're going into the lunch program. But Linda said to me, but that means that now we need them for our clients as well. So if you're seeing the same requests over and over, it, that's why. The other thing is uh, the number of people that they support each month is around 150. We are the only church that continually monthly supports this food bank by means of taking food. And it is a ministry. And I just want to say thank you to everyone that, that gives to this this uh, cause because it's needed in our community so I wanted to share that so now we're going to go to prayer and before we do if is there anybody that would have a prayer that I'm maybe not aware of okay so let's bow our head in prayer Lord we come to you in prayer this morning and we think of those in our congregation that have been ill and continue to struggle. We give thanks, Lord, for Erin, for her return to Perth. Lord, we continue to pray for Erin for a full recovery. We pray, Lord, that you will bring back her memory fully and that you will help her to just make peace with where she's living. We continue to pray for Julie Brayson's son, Joe, for Aunt Mary Doherty, for Sandy Crabb, for Tammy Bragdon, God, you know each of their needs, you know what, what they are going through, and we just pray, God, that they'll reach out to you for comfort and for hope. We continue to pray for those who are dealing with cancer. We pray for Jen Hansen, who we are so thankful for that she's returning to work after cancer treatments, and we pray, God, that you will just help her in that return and give her strength. We continue to pray for Stella McLaughlin, for Marlene Foster's Aunt Pam, for Terry Everett's brother-in-law Brent, for Tammy Wright's sister Carlene, and Sabrina's Aunt Gloria. Lord, you know where each person is in their walk with cancer. We pray, God, that they will turn to you. We pray that they will get hope and comfort and to feel your presence in a very strong way, Lord, each and every day during this walk. Lord, we give thanks this morning that we can gather here together with COVID restrictions that have been lifted, and we pray, God, for continued safety. As our world opens up and as our country opens up, may we be safe living with this pandemic, Lord, and we just pray, God, that the vaccines will work and that we'll continue to to have a normal life and learn how to live in a safe way. Lord, we pray for those that are grieving and we think of the family of James Dion. We pray, Lord, for anybody else who is grieving a, a lost one. We pray, Lord, for our ministry of grief share. We pray, God, that you will bless this ministry 
that it will become known in the community that there is a safe place to come and share and to grieve together. Lord, we pray also for our prayer walk ministry. We pray, God, for those who are taking part in the prayer, prayer walk, that you will bless them, that you will bless this ministry, and that prayer will become something that's very common and that we do each and every day for all of our community. Lord, we pray also for our children's ministry, and especially, God, for our year-end um, carnival. We pray, God, that you will bless that ministry, it will reach out to the community, and that the kids will come and fellowship and think of this church as a, as a great place to be. Lord, we pray for our other ministries that will be opening up now that COVID has lessened. We pray for our ladies' ministry and for our fellowship ministry. And we just pray, God, that we'll get back to where we were pre-COVID, where we can just uh, have time together and, and fellowship together. We pray, God, for our leaders. We pray for Pastor Nathan and Sabrina. We pray, pray that you'll bless them on their vacation and that they'll recuperate and uh, have some downtime and just be refreshed to come back and lead us. We pray also for Pastor Andrew and Pastor Sheila. We pray, God, that you will guide and direct these leaders of our church and direct your church in the way that you want us to go. Lord, we pray for the elders and the deacons of the church and all other members of our church, God, and their families. Will you bless them, take care of them, guide them in their walk with you? God, we pray also for the people out west that are dealing with the wildfires. We pray, God, for the people that are responsible for fighting those fires, for all that they endanger their lives to try and keep others safe. We pray, God, for the people who are living in the areas and dealing with the smoke and everything else that is happening around the wildfires out west in Ontario. We pray, God, that they will get under control and that rain will come. And Lord, I pray for our village. I pray for our mayor and councillors. I pray for all that they do for our village, for all the time that they give. We pray, God, for unity amongst that council and mayor, that they will just come to good decisions to move our village forward and may they continue to grow our village and make it a beautiful place to stay and live and God I pray for each person here present I pray God that their walk with you will grow deeper each day I pray God that each person here and watching online will come to know you in a very deep and meaningful way and I pray, God, that you will bless each person. Amen. So if you want to stand, we're going to do one more song before we close.
as we learned in Psalm 71 this morning, God is not like us. He's unswervingly true to his promise. And we can lean on and learn from prayer of one who's actively rehearsing God's faithfulness. We can choose to worship. When there's pain in the earth, we choose to worship. We know that God's present. He's there with us in the future. He's faithful all the time. And we have to be sure that we don't get caught up in doubt and fear. Let your heart be swept up in God. Dare to hope. Dare to love. Dare to trust. Dare to believe. And run continually to, to God. And in Hebrews 11, 1 to 3, we're reminded, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that that what is, that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your continuity, that you're always there with us. Thank you for wanting to have that relationship with us, for being will willing to be part of us, to tr teach us, to train us, and Lord, help us to be willing to love you, to praise you, to find our hope in you and continually serve you. Be with us as we go out this week, that we remember to do those same things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <laughs>